I get a lot of questions from new wholesalers, but one of the most common is what happens if I can't find a buyer? Most of them are concerned what happens if they cannot perform. Will they get sued or will they get in trouble? And in today's video, I'm going to explain exactly what happens if you cannot find a buyer and why it happens in the first place. And if you are new to the channel, my name's Justin, you're wrong. I'm a real estate investor and entrepreneur here in Las Vegas. I've made hundreds of videos teaching people about real estate. And the goal of this channel is to help you grow your money and mindset. Also, if you want to see more personal content, follow me on Instagram at Justin You're Wrong. First of all, here's why you can't find a buyer in the first place. There are really two main reasons. Reason number one, it's because it's not a good deal. And this is probably the most common reason as to why a new wholesaler cannot sell their deal. It's because when they send their deal to their buyers list, those buyers are saying, hey, like we can only pay up to this price when you have it locked up at this price. We could buy at this price, but not this. And so more often than not, the wholesaler has the deal locked up too high. And if you don't know what I mean by locked up, I'm essentially saying that most wholesalers offer on a home too high. And once you have an accepted offer where a seller actually accepts your offer, we call that a locked up deal. And if you want to prevent this from happening to you, just make sure that you fully understand how to calculate the numbers and calculate a good max offer. I'm not going to teach you how to calculate your max offer in this video, but I actually made a separate video explaining in detail how to calculate your max offer. And if you want to watch that, just make sure you watch that after you finish this video. The second reason why you cannot find a buyer is because you probably don't have a big enough buyers list. So maybe you do have a good deal, but when you send it to your list of five buyers, maybe none of them want to buy it and you don't have enough people on your list who actually want to buy deals. This actually happened to me when I was just starting out. I knew I locked up a good deal and I knew I wanted to wholesale the home, but when I went to send it to my buyers list of about 20 people, no one jumped on it. No one wanted to buy it. And I was shocked at the time, but looking back, I should not have been shocked because I only had a buyers list of 20 people. So in that case, I just started reaching out to as many other buyers as I could, whether it was Facebook groups or reaching out to other investors who knew buyers. And I was just reaching out to everyone possible who I knew might want to buy a home. And eventually I found the end buyer and I signed the deal to them and made a profit. But in the beginning, I could not find an end buyer because my buyers list was too small. I'm not gonna teach you how to build your buyers list in this video, but if you want to see a video on that, let me know in the comments below and I'll make a video on it. Now, if we want to talk about what happens to you if you cannot find an end buyer when you go to wholesale a home, it really depends on the terms of your contract and what you and the seller agreed upon. And of course, I am not a lawyer, so I cannot give you legal advice as far as what you should have in your contract and what you should not have. But what I will say is that two main factors of your contract decide your fate as far as what happens to you if you cannot find a buyer. The first factor that decides your fate is your earnest money deposit clause and how much earnest money you actually put down. And if you've never heard of an earnest money deposit, it's essentially a good faith deposit that you as the buyer will put down to make sure that the seller knows that you are serious about buying the home. And the actual amount of the earnest money deposit is completely negotiable between you and the seller. I've personally seen earnest money deposits as low as a dollar or zero dollars up to like $10,000. It really just ranges depending on the purchase price of the property and what you can negotiate with you and the seller. I do recommend, however, that you actually put some type of earnest money deposit down just as a good faith gesture to the seller. And the majority of my deals have an earnest money deposit of $500. Of course, if you don't have money, you can put less. And the reason why the earnest money deposit exists in the first place is because if you as the buyer or the wholesaler cannot perform, so if you cannot close on the deal for the seller, the seller has the right to take the earnest money deposit under certain conditions. I'll get to that later, but that's why it's there. That's why we call it a good faith deposit. Deposit. The second factor that decides your fate is the due diligence period in the contract. If you've never heard of due diligence, this is what it means. The due diligence period is essentially the time for you to verify your facts and investigate the property even more so that you make sure that you're actually buying a property that you want to buy. To make sure that there's nothing in the property that might stop you from buying it. So maybe during your due diligence phase, you are inspecting the property and maybe you find a roof that is falling apart. Maybe you found out that the AC unit has fallen through the roof and you didn't know that before. 
Yes, this has actually happened to me, but essentially it's basically your investigation period for you to verify everything about the property. And just like the earnest money deposit, the due diligence period is negotiable between you and the seller. I've seen as low as one day due diligence periods and I've seen as long as 90 day due diligence periods. It really just depends on what you and the seller agree upon. But I would say that the typical due diligence period is somewhere around 10 to 14 days. And the reason why the time frame is so important regarding the due diligence period is because it has a very big effect as far as deciding whether you as the buyer or wholesaler will get the earnest money deposit or if the seller will get your earnest money deposit. So for example, let's say you and the seller agree upon a 10 day due diligence period. And on day 12, you find out that you cannot find a buyer and you want to back out. So you locked up the deal way too high, you cannot find a buyer. It's now day 12 out of the 10 day due diligence period. Basically, if you were to back out after your due diligence period was over, the seller is entitled to keep your earnest money deposit. However, the opposite is also true. So if you are in your 10 day due diligence period and it's day five and you find out that you cannot find a buyer or you locked up the property for too high and you want to back out, and you do back out, you as the buyer or wholesaler are entitled to get your earnest money deposit back. This is why the time frame of the due diligence period is extremely important. Also keep in mind that the shorter your due diligence period is, the stronger or the more attractive your offer becomes to the seller. The concept is kind of similar to the earnest money deposit in the sense that the larger your earnest money deposit is, the stronger your offer appears to the seller. Also, regardless of what your contract says, Understand that there will always be a fight for that earnest money deposit if someone backs out. This is true even if one party is obviously entitled to keep the earnest money deposit. There's always a battle to who keeps the earnest money deposit. And this is the case because both the buyer and the seller have to sign off to say who keeps the earnest money deposit. Another thing that's important to note is that if you agree upon sending an earnest money deposit with the seller in the contract, and you don't actually send in an earnest money deposit. The contract becomes void, so you don't even have a contract if you did not send your earnest money deposit in when you agreed to send it. Now that you understand the intricacies of the contract and what happens to you in certain situations, here's what you can actually do if you can't actually find a buyer and you're trying to wholesale the deal. For whatever reason, if you cannot find a buyer for your deal and you can't assign it to someone, you can do two things. Number one, you can back out of the deal. Now, what happens to you if you do decide to back out of the deal, it really depends on what is in the contract and what you agreed upon. So what does the earnest money deposit say? What is the due diligence period? And did you back out in the due diligence period or did you back out after the due diligence period? And if you had to back out during the due diligence period, you're entitled to keep your earnest money deposit. However, if it was after the due diligence period and you have to back out, then the seller is entitled to keep that deposit. Now, even though that you can back out, I don't necessarily recommend for you to do so. The second option is to renegotiate. And this is the option that I recommend for you to attempt first. If you found out that you offered too much for the home, then you can always go back to the seller and just try to renegotiate. I will say this though, don't try to renegotiate unless you know what price that you need to be at in order to make money on the deal. For example, if you have a deal locked up or an accepted offer for $100,000 and you send that deal out to your buyer's list, and majority of your buyers are trying to pay $90,000 for that home because that's where they need to be at in order to make money, then you can try to go back to the seller and renegotiate at a price that's lower than $90,000 so that you know you can still make money on the home. But the worst thing that you can do for yourself is to renegotiate a price that you're still not sure if you can even find a buyer for and end up not being able to perform. That's just flat out bad business and it hurts your reputation. So don't do that. Make sure that you renegotiate a price where you're confident that you can find another buyer. And when it comes to renegotiating with the seller, you can either do one of two main things. There are a lot of other strategies out there, but one way that you can approach it is to use your inspection period. So maybe you brought out an inspector or some contractors out to the home and you found out that it's gonna take you a lot more money to fix up the home and you can use that to pitch the seller so you can kind of tell them something like hey it's gonna take a lot more work than I initially thought to fix up the home in order for us to make money on this home we need to be at this price so you can say something like that or you can take a different approach that's just flat-out honest and you can say hey we completely misjudged the deal 
it's completely our fault, we messed up, but if we still want to buy this thing and we still do, we need to be at this price in order for the numbers to make sense for us. And more often than not, if you are just completely honest with a seller, they're going to respect you for it and it's just good business. But if you and the seller end up not being able to renegotiate a new price, then you can just back out and if you're in the due diligence period, you can get your earnest money deposit back. And if you're not in the due diligence period still, they are going to keep the earnest money deposit, most likely. Also, if you want help to grow your real estate business, whether you are brand new or if you already have deals under your belt, DM me the word coach on Instagram at Justin You're Wrong. Peace.